welcome to Cine Monica. The White Lotus has been a hot topic this week because of the season finale. For me personally, this show has taken over my thoughts for the past few weeks. I mean, I've been theorizing, I've been analyzing, I've rewatched and rewatched the season. It is just that good. I hadn't felt this way about a TV show for a while. I mean, probably House of the Dragon, but even then, I wasn't rewatching every episode, you know. I truly believe The White Lotus is the best TV show that has come out this year. So let's get into it. The first season of The White Lotus, which came out last year, was very well received, so it's no wonder why it got renewed for a second season, and now it has been renewed for a third season, so that's exciting. The first season mostly dealt with class, money, entitlement, more specifically, the entitlement of rich white people. It was in Hawaii and it followed this very affluent people in a luxurious hotel called White Lotus and it just showed how much more advantage those with money, power, and status have over the lower working class. To me, the show is very interesting, not only because of the topics, the themes, but also because of the incredibly funny and smart writing. It also includes a roster of characters who are so interesting, nuanced, well-written, and who are dimensional. And not only that, but there's this added mystery to the show as well. The series starts and the first thing that you are told is that somebody dies at the end of the show. Throughout this entire season, there's someone that dies, you don't know who, you don't know how, or at the hands of who. You don't know any of the circumstances. So not only you're invested in all of these characters, their relationships, how they interact with each other, but you also spend the entire show wondering who is going to die. I personally really loved the first season when it first aired, and I was very excited for season two. I wasn't sure if they were gonna be able to write a better season than the first, because when something is that good, it's pretty hard to top, especially when you have a new story, new characters, new settings, new themes. I just wasn't sure that they were gonna be able to pull it off. As we all know, the second season is set in Italy this time. There's a White Lotus resort in Sicily and we have a new roster of characters, except for Tanya, Jennifer Coolidge's character, who is the only one that is in both seasons. Now let's go deep into season two because I feel like season two is the one that blew up and everybody's talking about it. And truthfully, I became obsessed with this, so I understand. <laughs> Season 2 has an entirely new focus, sex, transactional relationships, infidelity. All of our new characters will find themselves dealing with these things throughout their trip and we are informed of that from the very beginning with the opening sequence. Is there a more perfect intro to a show? I am obsessed with the song, I want it played at every club, in the elevators, in the grocery store. It's just so great. Aside from the way that they took this banger of a song and made it even better for season two, the opening sequence is great because it very subtly details a lot of things about the show, about the characters, and about the ending. And that's what I loved about the show, the way that it's so smart. Every single action, piece of dialogue, and even clothing have so much meaning behind it. Speaking of clothing, let's talk about that for a second. Portia. Of course, it's no surprise Portia's outfits have been making the rounds online with lots of people criticizing her fashion choices and I mean with good reason, like girl, what is this combination? The actress who plays Portia, Hayley Lou Richardson, who by the way is a great actress and is in one of my favorite movies, Columbus, you should all check it out. She even admitted to using a lot of her own clothing pieces to style Portia, something a lot of people were saying she was bold to admit. But to be honest, I really commend her for it because Portia's outfits were absolutely perfect for her character. She's someone who definitely doesn't know who she is. Her life is a bit of a mess. She's unhappy, even in Sicily. Her outfits just reflect how directionless she is. How she gets carried away with what's trendy and shiny and exciting. <clears throat> Jack. Wearing literally every single micro trend possible all at once. Honestly, I think it was the perfect costume design for her character. I especially love how at the end of the show, her outfit was so chaotic that it perfectly represented her life at that moment. A true mess. Let's talk about the DeGrassos. More like the DeGrossos. Am I right? Bert, Dom, and Obby. Three generations, the grandfather, father, and son. Holy Spirit. This family is very interesting to me because at first we are made to believe that Obby basically rejects everything that the other two men represent. He's not misogynistic, he respects women, and he's kind. He's definitely not like other men. That's what he wants to believe anyways. Dom is someone who is an admitted sex addict, he cheated on his wife multiple times, lied, and now he's paying the price. His wife wants to divorce him. Bert is someone who grew up in a very different, 
very sexist times. He often boasts about how he was able to be sneaky and get away with his infidelities when he was younger. He's very crude and honest and um still a very sexual man. On that very first episode, he basically hit on every single female employee at the White Lotus, and that just tells you everything you need to know about him. The DeGrasses are in Sicily because they themselves come from a Sicilian family, and they want to get to know their relatives. Following the themes in season 1 of entitlement and privilege, the DeGrasses make their way to their relatives' homes, thinking that they're gonna receive them with open arms, probably with like a home-cooked meal. I was so excited to watch this scene because I knew exactly what was gonna happen. I mean, I didn't expect them to be threatened with an artichoke, but it was pretty close. Of course, these men arrive without a plan, without a gift, without even speaking the language, and they expect these Italian women to just welcome them into their home with open arms. I found it very interesting how Bert, as soon as they arrived to the resort, he kept telling the employees, you know, we're Sicilian, we're just like you, we're the same, when in reality they're not. He might be Sicilian by blood, but when he hasn't put any single amount of effort into learning about the culture or even the language, even just a few phrases, there's no way they can be considered the same. Dom is a character that I found very, very interesting. He has definitely been a cheater and a liar, but I felt like throughout the season he was the only one that was kind of willing to change for the better. Yes, he did hire Mia and Lucia in the first episode, but he soon realized that he felt bad about it, that he didn't want to continue to be this guy. He's nice to Lucia and Mia and even lets them stay in the hotel for a week. He tried to protect Lucia when he thought that she was being abducted by Alessio, and he in fact did more than Albi in that situation. Albi was the one who was saying to let Lucia go, to not escalate the situation. I think Dom was a good character. Well, I don't think his wife should necessarily take him back. I do think he wants to better his life in terms of his addiction. Can he? I don't know. At the end of the season, it doesn't seem like he changed that much with that scene of the three men turning around to see that woman at the airport. But at least throughout this season, he tried to change. I, I found his character very interesting because of all of this internal conflict. Albi, Mr. Nice Guy. He is the epitome of a quote-unquote nice guy. He wanted to be Lucia's savior so bad, he got his dad to give him $50,000 to give to her, to save her from Alessio and take her to LA with him. He was even willing to trade his own views about his father's infidelity and how he has said previously he didn't want to speak highly of Dom to his mom. He was willing to sacrifice that because of this Italian girl that he met. Speaking of that airport scene at the end, I really loved that scene because the three DeGrasso men turn around as soon as they see this attractive woman walk by. You expect it from Dom and Bert, but of course, Albi ends up turning around as well. He is turning into what he hated about his grandpa and dad. Honestly, I thought it was a great scene. Moving on to the couples, Harper and Ethan and Cameron and Daphne, the four horsemen of the White Lotus. Harper and Ethan have what seems like a stable relationship at first. They are smart, a little uptight, especially Harper, but on the surface it seems like they are grounded people who don't live in a world of fakeness and fantasy like they believe Cam and Daphne are doing. Cam and Daphne are the fun, hot couple. They seem like they're really happy, but this makes Harper very suspicious. Can they really be that happy or are they putting up a front? Harper and Ethan's relationship starts getting very tumultuous throughout the season. Their spark seems to have faded and Ethan doesn't want to be intimate with Harper anymore. I think what's great about the White Lotus is the interpersonal relationships that we get to explore. Harper and Ethan's, Cam and Daphne's, Harper and Daphne's, Ethan and Cam's. I mean, it really is a study of people and their relationships with one another. Cam and Daphne have seemingly found a way to make their marriage work. They have this kind of unspoken agreement. Here comes the trainer talk. Daphne confesses to Harper how she has ways to fulfill her own happiness. She says she has this gorgeous trainer who is blonde with blue eyes, and then she shows Harper a picture of her kid who is blonde with blue eyes. It is implied that not only is she having an affair with her trainer, but that her kid might not even be Cam's. This seems like an insane thing to do, but she says she doesn't consider herself a victim. She does what she needs to do while Cameron does what he wants as well, and then they come back to each other. She tells Harper to find herself a trainer. And oh, a trainer she finds. <laughs> Daphne is definitely my favorite character of the show. She takes the cake. Hopefully she'll take all the awards too. I mean, Megan Fahey did an extraordinary job in my opinion. Her facial expressions during that one scene with Ethan in the last episode, I mean, that was some of the best acting of the show. She said so much with just her eyes and her faded smile. Side note, do you guys think that she was more disappointed in Cam 
for, you know, cheating yet again? Or was she more disappointed in Harper, someone who she had started to consider a friend who she didn't think would do something like that, someone who she even had confided in? She had said previously she doesn't have any female friends, presumably because Cam either hits on all of them or sleeps with them, and this time Harper was no different. So what do you think? Was she mad at Cam or at Harper? Daphne is also the most interesting character. She just has so much depth. I mean, at first we are made to believe that she's just this rich housewife who is kind of aloof. You think she's just a hot LA yoga mom who is happy with her rich hot husband, but there is just so much more to her. She also had some of the most interesting lines about husbands murdering their wives on vacation, husbands that cheat end up buried in a yard, which really made me think she had something to do with whoever died at the end. I mean, I didn't think she would kill anybody, but that at least she would know what was going on, you know? That's what I thought at least. Eve and Harper have a couple of huge fights, but ultimately their relationship is tested when Harper admits that her and Cameron kissed. I personally think they would have done more than that if Ethan hadn't come up to the room. Ethan and Daphne end up having a little revenge something which by the way was in the intro all along and with this the couple that first judged the other couple for living in this fake lying cheating relationship is now doing the same to save their relationship just like Albie despised what his dad and grandpa are but ended up just like them Harper and Ethan ended up having a little taste of that Daphne and Cam lifestyle that they hated so much Lucia and Mia. Beautiful and smart, they truly won at the end. They both got what they wanted out of people and they used their sexuality to get it. Lucia was able to scam Albi out of $50,000 and Mia became the hotel singer slash piano player. Their characters were so much fun, so interesting and added an exciting touch to the show. I loved how they were involved in basically all of the storylines and to be honest, I was a little worried for them, especially Lucia because I didn't think they would end up at the top. I'm glad that they were the ones that were able to live their happy ending. That's what I love about the show, how exciting it is, how so many different things could have happened. Put your hands together for Lucia and Mia. Valentina was another character that I really loved this season. She's not a good boss. I mean, she's using her power to basically become closer to her employees. That's definitely not morally good or professional. But I couldn't help but root for her when she found out that Isabella was engaged to Rocco. Something about Sabrina and Pagliatore's acting made Valentina seem like someone who was incredibly hurt in the past. I did read an interview where she said she made this entire backstory about Valentina in her head. It was basically that she was married before, got divorced of course, and now she just doesn't really know how to interact with people. That's why we see her be so kind to the kitties on the street. She doesn't know how to interact with women, much less flirt. What I liked about Valentina is that in the end, she was able to get over her imaginary beef with Rocco and be genuinely happy for him and Isabella. I mean, she really seemed like she was remorseful of how she acted. Also, she was not expecting a relationship with Mia. Mia let her know very clearly that she isn't gay, but that they can still hang out and she can even help her get some dates. It truly made me happy to think about Lucia, Mia, and Valentina hanging out and them being Valentina's wingmen. Okay, Tanya the star of the show. Mike Wyatt, the creator, he said that he specifically created the show because he wanted to work with Jennifer Coolidge. It's no wonder why she is the only character who is in both seasons, but he specifically said that he wanted this season to be all about Tanya. He wanted to give Tanya this incredible experience in Sicily. I mean, you saw her, she went on a Vespa, she ate spaghetti with clams. She lived this fabulous life until, you know, the very end. She was truly the most hilarious character with the best lines. But basically everything she said can now be quoted to eternity and will make for amazing memes and reaction photos. But Tanya is not only a meme. She is a character with so much depth, with story, a character so defined that even in her very last moments, she was being unapologetically herself. Tanya is someone who is very self-absorbed, a narcissist who is incapable of thinking even for a second about someone else. Even when she's thinking about Greg, she does it in a way that affects her. Everything she does has to do with herself. Everything she says has to do with how she feels. She doesn't really care for other people as we saw in the first season when she left Belinda stranded after selling her a dream of investing in her own spa. 
Tanya is not a good person. She's not necessarily a bad person either. She's just, like I said, extremely self-absorbed. By the way, one of my favorite foreshadowings on the show is when she says she wants to be Monica Vitti for the day. And Valentina says this. Certainly ended up like Monica Vitti, didn't she? <laughs> Tanya is at the resort with Greg, a piece of sh I mean, her husband. After fulfilling her dream of being Monica Vitti for the day, Greg tells Tanya that he needs to go to Denver for work. She's super mad, of course, and later that night she hears him say I love you to someone on the phone. This, of course, makes her think that Greg is having an affair. This is when she befriends the high-end gays, who successfully convince her to party and forget about Greg. Tanya is such an interesting character who definitely didn't deserve what she got in the end, but the fact that she chose to ignore all of the clear signs and be in denial definitely put her in a very vulnerable position. She had a dream where she saw Greg with shark eyes, she went to the psychic who explicitly told her that Greg was not being sincere, and she was still in denial about it all. Even when she saw the photo of Quentin and Greg when they were young cowboys, she still believed Quentin when he said, um, no, that's, that's Steve. She was like, oh, okay, yeah, Steve. Jennifer Coolidge is a master of comedy. Her delivery of lines, her body language, her facial expressions, all of this makes Tanya such a lovable character. Even if her death was tragic, it was still so Tanya. She didn't even take her sparkly heels off before jumping in the little boat. I mean, she could have just jumped in the water. But in true Tanya fashion, she died a derpy death, as Mike White put it. I honestly thought it was the perfect way for her to go, as sad as it is because we won't be seeing her in season three, unless it's a prequel about maybe Tanya and her mother going to another White Lotus. I mean, just throwing out ideas out there, Mike. The guessing game about who died, who was the killer, all of that really is such a fun thing about the White Lotus because it literally made me want to dissect everything that the characters said or did. I mean, this is one of the few shows where I don't skip the intro, not only because of the song, but also because of all the clues, you know, in the intro itself. The way Ethan was spiraling, the way he kept staring at the Testa de Moro statues, which were a symbol of death because of infidelity, also made the audience believe something really messed up was gonna go down with these couples. I personally thought Ethan was going to end up dead. I also thought Jack was gonna kill Portia. I thought Tanya was gonna kill Quentin. I mean, that did happen, so I got one at least. I had so many theories that didn't come true, and honestly, I really loved that about the show. There were so many clues and dialogue that hinted at murder, and it could have gone just about a hundred different ways. Like I said, I don't think I had ever been so deep into a show where I want to analyze every little thing. As I did with The White Lotus. I truly believe The White Lotus was the best TV show of 2022 because with every new episode there were new theories arising. Aside from the mystery, the relationships between the characters, how they used sex and money as transactions, and as a way to get something out of somebody. It's truly an entertaining look into the way that people interact with of course a spicy mystery sprinkled on top. I'm gonna need at least 15 more seasons of The White Lotus each of them in different locations, which makes it just so interesting and exciting. But the next one needs to feature Daphne, please. Did you watch The White Lotus? Who was your favorite character and why? Did you like the ending? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments and also please recommend me a new show because now, what am I gonna do now? Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you on the next one, bye.